Is that something that uh, sits with us? Is that something that resonates in our spirit? When everything else around us is sinking sand? It's interesting. We go to the beaches and we say, oh yeah, I've always been here. This is familiar to me. But the reality is every time we go to the beach, the landscape, if we look really closely, is different every time because of the wind that comes and shifts the sand. But in the midst of shifting sands and shifting landscapes, Christ is solid. Hallelujah. Christ is our solid rock. Just before we go live um, with our online family this morning, is anyone else who'd like to share or ask for prayer for something? I've got a celebratory point at the end before we do go live.
I'm glad you're part of the Fast family, Freddie. Don't forget, Ben. Say welcome this morning to our FAS Online family. Uh, welcome. We don't know where you're joining us from, but we're glad that you've been able to join us. We're a church in the scenic room, and uh, you've got to put up with me on the piano this morning, so I apologise in advance. I'm not sure there's much that they can do with the recording stuff to be able to make it better, so we'll just go with what we've got, all right? Um, but uh, there's a few of our family away today, and uh, some of them are serving uh, in the uh, emergency catering space, so we want to Pray God's blessing on them, and uh, we are looking forward to what God's going to say to us this morning in the sermon later where we say we're going to reclaim our calling, reclaim our calling. But this morning, the first song that we're going to sing together, um, and the words will come up on the screen for those, well, it'll come up on the screen here, and by the magic of television, it'll happen somewhere else as well. But for those that are joining us online, it'll come up across the bottom of the screen, and uh, we're going to sing together, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, but abound in the desert place, but walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in glory, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, the road marked with suffering, the pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in light, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name.
the, the band is going to uh, lead us in our next song, and it says, Lord, I come to you. It's about responding. Like we talked about earlier in the service, we, we read a scripture for those that have joined us on our online. We looked at a scripture this morning from Numbers chapter 6, 24 to 26, and we said that it, this is what uh, Aaron it was to, to pray over the people of Israel. And so our response is found in this song. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed. We don't just turn up to get something, do we? We turn up so that we can be transformed by His Spirit to be more like Christ. So as we sing together these words, the offering will be received. Thank you for your, the way in which you use our gifts, the way in which you give us gifts, Lord. And Lord, this morning we offer to you not just our monetary gifts, but our time, our treasures, and also, Lord, our lives. We offer, to the, offer them to you in worship, not just on Sunday mornings, God, but all the week through. And so this morning we acknowledge the gifts that you've given to us. We also want to bring back to you a portion of those gifts, we would ask that you would bless them and use them for the furtherment of your kingdom across the Fassifern Valley and beyond. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. This morning the scripture reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, you might think, how are we getting a calling out of being a prisoner? Well, work with me, we'll see how we go, all right? As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. And just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, but to each of us, to each one of us, has been given as Christ apportioned it. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So here we are, our second week of that uh, series on called. What does it mean to be called? Last week, Debbie uh, shared with us and she said a couple of things that have stuck with me during the week. 
She said, calling is about who you are, not about what you do. How often is it that we say to somebody, oh, what's your name? What's the next question? What do you do? It's almost like what we do somehow makes up something of who we are, when it's not that at all. How much more of an awkward question would it be if we said, what's your name and whose are you? What's your name and whose are you? Whose team are you on? How awkward would it be also if you walked up and said, G'day, my name's Wes and I'm a follower of Jesus? It's not usually the second sentence that comes out of our mouth, is it? But one would hope that through the conversations that we have and the actions that people see, that they would see a Jesus follower. We may not actually say it, but the power is not about, our calling is not about what we do. It is about who we we are. And I would go one step further and say, whose we are. The second thing is that uh, stuck with me was calling is not about something important that we will do in the future. Calling is about the faithfulness that we give to God in the now. It's about our faithfulness to God today. I don't know about you, but when uh, I stand up to speak, I try as best I can not to mumble. There would be some that, if they had to do public speaking, they would not like to use the same voice. Um, there's, I try not to have a nervousness in my voice on a Sunday. I'll let you in on a secret. Every Sunday for the last lots of years, I've been nervous, every single one. Sometimes it's not about, but we change our voice, don't we? You go into a school setting, you see teachers, you're chatting to them in the playground, then they go and lead the class after lunch and it's a different tone. And then when the kids decide to play their own sort of, play by their own set of rules, and there's a re- renewing of who's who in the zoo and who's running this show, there's a different tone again with the teacher, isn't there? Is that right? For the teachers in the room, we don't need to mention names, but we'd probably get some nods in the room, right? There's a different tone that gets used. And uh, one of my kids had this... Actually, both of my children had this teacher. She was the sweetest person I had ever met until I happened to drop in on the class one day and they were climbing the walls... I thought they had a relief teacher. It was like chalk and cheese, right? There's a difference when you're called. Even when we're at home and we get called by our parents, I roughly knew how much trouble I was in depending on how much of my name got used. Is that the same at anyone else's house? And you knew when the whole entire thing was used, it's probably not a great idea to go. Like, that's... When the full name gets used, it's usually run in an opposite direction is probably a safer bet. Has anyone ever had that? They just get the whole name and then you know, it's on. Like I've pushed mum or pushed, well, it was always mum at my house, but I've pushed mum too far this time. We know when someone calls us, don't we? When you get on a phone... um, When we were growing up, my mum used to always say, when you're on the phone, you always say, hello, it's Wes, right? Or you say your name. There are some people that we're familiar with that we just start talking and then you realise, oh, you know, um, I was, then it it takes a little while for you to sometimes pick up who it is on the other end of the phone. Uh, I'm probably more guilty of that than I realise sometimes, but um, when there's a familiar voice, you know that voice, right? There's a comfort when you hear that voice. I was, um, I went a number of weeks ago, I tripped across a, and it's quite literally 
came across a car accident um, with a couple of the guys in the church. We were driving somewhere and we came across a car accident and two of the people that were involved in the accident were okay. But once somebody heard, one of the victims heard a familiar voice, that's when we cut through and they started to, you know, grieve and be visibly upset. Before that, we couldn't seem to break through, but they heard a familiar voice and it seemed to cut really quick. You want to hear that voice, don't you? When, when you're, when you, um, there's, you can send text messages, you can, uh, there's all different forms of communication, but there's nothing the same as when you hear it with someone's voice. And so this morning we're talking about being called by God for a purpose. As Paul shared here, he was a prisoner for the Lord. It wasn't just because I'm in jail. We read the story of the, his letter to the church in Philippi, and he says, consider it pure joy, right? When trials come against you, what? whoa, hang on. No, I'm not going to choose joy. I think, every time I think of you, I think glad thoughts. It says in Philippians 1. And I'm confident that the, that the same God who began a good work will, com, will be faithful to complete it. He does all these things from jail. What a viewpoint to have. Therefore, I, a prisoner of, for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. What does it look like to live a life worthy of your calling? Does that mean that the calling that God has placed upon my life is the same as he's placed upon you? No. But he hasn't called me to your calling either. We are a part of what um, is referred to within uh, theological study as the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. The, um, and so for us to be called out, we are each called. It is not reliant on one or two, but we all have a calling. We all have a job to do. And at the end of Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it does not say, some of you go out and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't have a distinction on how many at all. So the assumption is it is for all. Go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the neighbor of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and surely I'll be with you always. There's the other part. If the calling's for all in making disciples of, of, of the whole world, then the promise is for all as well. That he'll be with us always to the end of the age. So what does it feel like to have a life that, is, that we live worthy of calling? You see, I totally believe, and I shared this at, during the response time last week, I totally believe and am convinced that there are some people who are called to be a teacher. I'm also convinced that I'm not. I joke with some of the teachers in this room uh, and that come to our church that, you know, I last a half an hour a week and feel like I've run a marathon. These guys do it every day of the week. It's not my thing, but it is theirs. I teach RE, and so God bless my class. Thanks for putting up with me this chunk of the year that we've been allowed to do it. But we do it for half an hour, 40 minutes, and it, sometimes it flies, and sometimes it feels like you're in knee-deep mud trying to survive and hoping that, you know... You make it. There are some people who are called to be teachers. There are some people who are called to be pastors. Just as much as I feel like a fish out of water when I'm teaching, if you have somebody that takes on someone else's calling, they would feel just the same way being a fish out of water. If it's not your calling, you know that it's not your calling.
You see, being a disciple maker and telling others about Jesus is not a, a job for the select few, but it's for all. It's for all. You see, living a life, as Romans 12, uh, Paul talks about, it's our um, everyday life is offered as a living sacrifice. It's not an added extra that we fit into our diary when we can or when we may, may, we may want. But no, it's not that at all. Being a Jesus follower, attending church is not. Is not at all about having an add-on. It's not if we're too busy for church or we're too busy to tell others about Jesus. No, we're called by God not to go to church, but to be the church. We're not called by God to go to church. Oh, I might just go to the church this morning. Well, no, I don't want anybody to go to church. Oh, God, Jesus commands us. He calls us to be the church. Monday through Saturday as well as on Sundays. I read this, I read this week a um, quote from a guy called Brennan Manning. And I want to share it with you this morning. Brennan Manning says these words. What makes authentic Christians is not visions, it's not ecstasies, it's not biblical mastery of chapter and verse or spectacular success in the ministry. But what makes authentic Christians is a capacity for faithfulness, buffeted by the fickle winds of failure, battered by the early emotions and bruised by rejection and ridicule. Authentic disciples may have stumbled. Goodness. Authentic disciples may well have frequently fallen, endured lapses and relapses, gotten handcuffed to the flesh pots and wandered into a far country. Yet they kept coming back to Jesus. Brennan Manning from his book Ragamuffin Gospel. And I sometimes, well, I often resonate with the, the Luke chapter 15 picture of what it means to come back to Jesus. He's always looking out for us. He's always calling for us. We often get distracted by the things of this world and in this world that we can't hear his calling. I don't know about some of you, but there are times in my life where I feel physically worn down, just drained, emotionally exhausted. And there are many times in my life where I struggle with discouragement within my own spirit. But what I do know is that the devil can't destroy it no matter what, because I am called. I am called by God and I want to live a life that's worthy of that calling. Yeah, I get distracted. Yep, I fall down. Yep, I have lapses in my, in my emotional journey. But in the midst of all of that, God is a God of grace. And for me not to acknowledge the fact that I'm dinted, broken, chips off, paint, paint scratched life, then while ever I don't acknowledge those things, I'm diluting God's everlasting grace in my life. Why would I want to talk about a diluted form of his undeserved love and favor when I'm talking to others? Why would I want to dilute that? I would rather speak from an honest place. Have you ever used a GPS? Who loves them? Yeah, me too. But if mine goes flat and I need to go to Brisbane, I take Jeff. Munch will get me anywhere in Brisbane. Don't you worry about that. But um, I love GPS, but there's two key things. There's two key things you need. Patience. And a map. No, no. <laughs> Not in a map. 
There's two key things you need. One is you need to know where you're going and have the exact address. But you also need to know where you are. Right? You need to know where you are. Because if you don't know where you are, you're not going to get the right directions to where you want to go. So if we aren't honest about exactly where we are, we're never going to be able to get to where God is calling us to go. So this morning, how do we overcome discouragement, fatigue, exhaustion, self-doubts, spiritual opposition? How do we keep the passion going for days, weeks, months, years, or even decades? This morning, we're called. So this morning, I want to encourage you to reclaim that calling. What am I called to? Most people think it's a job. Most people think it's a role. It's none of those things. It's way more than that. It's about bring, being partnering with God in his mission to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So often throughout the Gospels, he talks about the kingdom of heaven is like. And our job is to reflect that and to join with him in the mission of bringing that to earth. You see, God never calls us to a job. He calls us to himself. He doesn't call you to a job. Sometimes a role is the way that our calling to himself manifests itself within the body. But that's not what he's calling us to. He's calling us to himself. He calls us to salvation. We're salvation people, aren't we? We're Easter people. It's because of the cross that we serve. It's because of the cross that we do what we do. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. He calls sinners to repentance. Sinners just like me. He calls us not just to salvation, but he calls us to sanctification as well. He calls us to live a life that's set apart, called by him to live a life that is a holy life. And he calls us to service. He calls us to use his, our gifts our time, our talents, our treasures to be part of the kingdom of heaven, uh, the bringing of the kingdom of heaven to this world, world. Whatever we do, in verse 17 of Colossians chapter 3, whatever we do, whether in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How do I know that I'm ready? How do I know that I'm ready to go? ready to respond to the call when you feel like you're not ready. That's when you should respond. Because what does Paul tell us? It's in my weakness that I boast about Christ's strength. It's in my inadequacies that I talk about the fact that it's His grace is sufficient for all of my needs. It's in my brokenness that I can talk about His healing. So don't think you've got to be good enough before you can give enough. Brothers and sisters, 1 Corinthians 1. Brothers and sisters, think of what you, were, what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influ influential. Not many of you were noble. How's that for encouraging? When you were called... You were untrained. When you were called, you were unqualified. When you were called, you were unprepared. You see, God doesn't call the prepared. He prepares the called. I want to read for you something. Whose job is it anyway? This is a story about four people. Named everybody, somebody, anybody and nobody. 
There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it. But nobody realised that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. The story might be a little confusing, but the message is clear. No one took responsibility, so nothing got accomplished. Right? We can leave it for somebody or anybody, but God didn't call anybody. He called you. God didn't call anybody. He called you. He didn't call somebody else to do your job. He called them for their calling. You see, God didn't call me immediately to be a pastor. He called me to himself. Sometimes we get criticism when we're following God's calling in our lives. Sometimes that can be a confirmation every time it hurts. You're called. You're called by God to live a life worthy. I want to give you two qualities this morning as we wrap up. Two qualities this morning of what it means to have a a calling. I want to tell you that when you have a calling and you respond to that calling, that calling costs. It's going to hurt. It's going to cost you something. When God called Saul, what happened? He was blinded by light didn't tell him the answer he let him journey it and he was blinded for a couple of days once he was healed he had a fairly strong resume one would say a fair bit of clout within Jewish circles to speak life and hope and grace and mercy and love into that situation if we look in Acts chapter 9 But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him. It goes on to say in verse 16. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What is it like to be God's chosen instrument For a particular setting. It is critical that if God is calling us to be his instrument, we may be called, as St. Francis of Assisi uh, prays, to be the channel of his peace. You notice in that prayer that, that... Um, St. Francis prays, he says, Lord, let me be a channel of your peace. It does not say, Lord, let me be a reservoir for your blessings. Right? We're not called to be a reservoir, we're called to be a channel. We're meant to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. God often uses our deepest pain to launch our greatest calling. Serving Jesus is a gift, but it can also be a grind. Living our calling can be a thrill, but it can also be a burden at times. Ministry and I believe that each of us is called to full-time ministry in our, own, in our chosen vocations within the workplace. There's an opportunity to plant seeds of hope, to speak life into some of the most, and to bring light in some of the most darkest places. That is absolutely, absolutely part of your calling to full-time ministry. And It's fair to say that ministry can be exhilarating at times. But it can also be thoroughly exhausting. 
if following Jesus isn't the greatest gift and the greatest burden, then we're probably not doing it properly, right? It's sometimes going to be great and costly all at the same time, and it's a consistent and constant wrestle. The biggest enemy of our calling is comfort. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone. We don't want to get out of the comfy chair. We've all been on, at home on a, you know, hot afternoon and sitting in the comfy chair and we're like, I'll just stay here another three or four minutes. Next thing you wake up, it's two in the morning. No one else has done that, have they? No one. Just, I don't want to point fingers, but uh, if I was to point fingers, they'd start right here. That's happened to me before. It happened to me when we lived in... Um, in a previous appointment and I'd fallen asleep out cold on the couch. Debbie used to leave the house on so that when I woke up I actually knew where I was. This particular night we had visitors, they thought they were doing a nice thing so they turned the entire house off. I thought I'd gone blind when I woke up. I, was, I couldn't see a thing. We had blackout curtains in our house. How I didn't break my arm or leg trying to get to the bedroom, which I usually have lights to help me with, is by the grace of God. But often we just stay in the comfiness for just a little bit more, right? Or just stay just a little bit longer. This morning, friends, I want to encourage you to never sacrifice your calling on the altar of comfort. Our calling sustains us, it carries us, it keeps us going. Yes, it costs. How do you think that Paul endured in the midst of being in jail? He kept his eyes on the prize. Paul did not finish because he was competent. Paul finished because he was called. Forgetting what is behind, he says in Paul's Paul's letter to the Philippians, forgetting what is behind and pressing on, towards the goal that is found in Christ Jesus for which God has called me to. I kept the faith, I finished the prize, I'm called to it and I'm reclaiming my calling. I've been distracted in the past and I'm reclaiming my calling. It could be the heart, there's no doubt that this year would have to have been in the last 16 years of minist- full-time ministry, this by far is the most difficult year that I've had. Because all the comforts of, of ministering within a church have all gone. I can't stop. I won't quit. I'm not gonna, it's not going to go away. I won't let it go. I'm never going to let up. I'm called. Paul says, hard pressed on every side, doesn't he? Not crushed, perplexed, not in despair, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed, called, been away from God, done bad, some bad stuff, been away from God, COVID took me out of the spiritual game at times. But in the midst of all of that, God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. They're irrevocable. The call cannot be taken away. This morning, I want to leave with you a a prayer from 2 Thessalonians. And I'm praying this for each of you this morning, both here in in the service, in person, and also for those online. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. That's the reason we're created, right? Is to bring glory and honour to God. Don't think that you've got to leave it for somebody else or for anybody or everybody. Or nobody. We've all got a calling, and it's your calling, not someone else's. So, I, when you uh, share together, we, we'll share, we're going to share together in song in just a moment. 
it's a real, it's a helpful song, I think, for us to be able to say, I have a maker, he formed my heart. Before time began, my life was in his hands. He knows your name. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call, but do we hear him when he calls us? Right? So we're going to sing this this morning. I have a maker. He formed my heart. I have a maker He formed my heart Before even time began My life was in His hand He knows my Father God, we acknowledge that you call us, that you hear us when we call to you as well. Lord, this is not a transactional relationship, but we work with you in partnership to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth here. And so, Lord, while we are created in your image, Lord, may we go out of from this place and be a reflection of that image within our world. Lord, give us opportunities to plant seeds of hope. Give us opportunities to speak about your grace and your hope and your, and your mercy, that you're a loving, merciful God who wants to speak into people's lives and transform them by the love of Jesus. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Our final song this morning is a great hymn of the church and that hymn says, Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before thee. The band's going to join us and we're going to be upstanding to sing our final song together before we join together in morning tea. I do have an announcement before the, while the band's still getting ready. That announcement is this. If you're a Word for, the de- a word for Today subscriber or you want to get one, the new ones are at the back. Thank you to those that mailed them. We're not thanking the middlemen. Let's not name names, but they took longer than they should have to get here. All right? But if you uh, a word for the today person, they're at the back. If we run out, let me know and I will order more. We want to make sure that the word is being broken in every home, every day. And let's sing together. I invite you to stand. <laughs>
Now for the benediction found in Philippians chapter 1. I thank God, my God, every time I remember you. In my, all my prayers for all of you, I will always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. God bless you each, friends. Have a great week.